It's My Nerd World, the Star Wars podcast, and welcome to it. On the show this week, Mandalorian Season 3 coming in 2022. A uh, leak from a website may be uh, hinting at when we can expect to see The Mandalorian Season 3 on the Disney Plus uh, streaming app. Plus, Bad Batch this week brings back, well, well, brings back is kind of like the wrong term. They kind of introduce and give the backstory on one of my favorite characters from the recent era of Star Wars storytelling. More comments from Patty Jenkins, director of Rogue Squadron, and what this means for the future of the films. And we'll tie all of this into the conversation um, with The Mandalorian and The Bad Batch and looking towards the future and what Disney and Lucasfilm have planned when it comes to how they intend to roll out the content. And for me specifically, and hopefully of interest to you, what this means for the future of the theatrical releases got a lot of ground to cover on this week's show i am so glad you're with the podcast let's go ahead and get right to it nothing will stand in our way i find your lack of faith disturbing i will finish what you started who are you i'm no one there are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. It's calling to you. My nerd road. Just let it in. And welcome to a Star Wars podcast here on My Nerd World. I am your host, John Justice. And like I said at the start of the show, I'm glad that you're with the podcast this week. Been on vacation uh, for the 4th of July uh, holiday. My birthday falls right in the middle of it, which is nice as well. So I've had some time off, which means I've done a lot of Star Wars watching. Not just The Bad Batch, which we'll be talking about later on in the show, but... um. Oddly, I found myself revisiting The Mandalorian almost by accident. And I know that sounds weird. So I've been editing book six in my Embark science fiction series. Uh, I am on the final read through before I hand it off to my beta readers and to the editor and have it released for, um, you know, for you to go and buy, which should hopefully happen sometime mid uh, mid August, um, end of the month of, of July or early August. I'm hoping at this point in time. So as I was reading the book, I decided just to um, to throw something on in the background. I was at the point of the process of editing where I was still running, running the uh, the book through my my uh, my grammar program uh, to uh, to make sure I've got as many mistakes removed as possible before I actually hand it off to the proofreader. And uh, I threw Mandalorian on in the background. I had the volume turned almost all the way down. But suddenly, I just, I don't know. I found myself wanting to not have it in the background. I found myself wanting to watch the show. And since I was on vacation, it was an easy thing for me to put the book aside that I was working on and to sit down and watch The Mandalorian. Now, on top of that, I also worked through watching the the sequel trilogy. And it's an interesting experiment when, at least for me, when you're watching these new pieces of Star Wars content that we've received since Disney purchased Star Wars from from George Lucas and seeing just how different all these different stories uh, directing styles are. There's a level of consistency, obviously, or I shouldn't say a level. There is a consistency in The Mandalorian. And if I had one complaint about the sequel trilogy, which is less a complaint and more just an observation, is just how those three films are all very different from one another. Uh, and I know I've talked about this before, and people have reached out on the show before and said, in their opinion, they feel the same way about the original trilogy. Um, I don't necessarily, uh, as I've mentioned many times, I think the prequels are the most consistent from the you know opening crawl of the Phantom Menace to the closing you know credits of uh, Revenge of the Sith. Those three films. They just, they all look seamless, right? You could, you could strip out 
the transitions and the credits of, of the movies and make it one big, huge, massive film, and it looks like it could have been all shot at the same time. And I personally appreciate that. I think there is there's something to be said about a level of consistency when it comes to sagas and series. Uh, I think of Harry Potter, and I know we've had different directors, and I'm not necessarily a Harry Potter fan, but while the first few films in that series uh, looked one way, once they once they shifted and got further into that series, the, the films all took on a very similar tone, a directorial tone, and, and a look. The um the recent Planet of the Apes trilogy is another good example of just the consistency of how all those films look together. Uh, the sequel trilogy is is odd because that first movie of the of the Force Awakens uh, is definitely a J.J. Abrams film, but it it was clear, at least in my in my view, it was clear that J.J. was trying to tap into some of the aesthetic of what we got in the original trilogy and specifically a new hope updated, obviously with the modern technology that we have. Uh, there wasn't a lot of, of use of, of lens flare or some of the signature items that JJ puts in almost all of his films, mostly at the hands of his cinematographer, right? Well, and then you get into the last Jedi and it looks completely different. In my opinion, the, the color palette is completely different. The way the film is shot is completely different. And then when you get into the rise of Skywalker, it really does feel like, and again, I was just reminded of this watching all three films. It really does feel like a an interesting mashup of what J.J. Abrams did in The Force Awakens, what Ryan Johnson did in The Last Jedi, on top of J.J. Abrams doing what J.J. Abrams normally does with with his movies. Which makes it really interesting because you kind of go Force Awakens and then you get this this tonal shift. Not even storytelling wise, this tonal shift when it comes to the Last Jedi, and then you get this interesting combination of both when in, in in the Rise of Skywalker, which is arguably one of the reasons why I love that movie so much is that I really do feel like with its brisk pacing and every scene for me as a fan um, being totally rewatchable. No moments in the film that I find myself wanting to skip through. It really is an, an interesting co- combination of those first two movies. But again, you compare that back to The Mandalorian, and The Mandalorian just has a consistency on it. And it definitely feels like the original Star Wars, which I think plays into a lot of the controversy and commentary around the sequel trilogy and people's expectations of what they want in Star Wars storytelling and a lot of it leaning uh, much on the nostalgia factor and the fact that The Mandalorian just feels like original trilogy Star Wars I think is what makes so many people gravitate towards it and why it's received such high praise. Um, I don't particularly carry their way. I just always want good storytelling. But it does raise an interesting question of what that storytelling is going to look like in the future, especially with all of the various projects that are that are coming in the next few years. I expect that the live action shows on Disney Plus will all feel very similar and will all have a very similar look and feel, especially those that are going to be using the volume um, digital screen backgrounds that The Mandalorian has used. We know Obi-Wan Kenobi is using that and or is using that to a certain extent, but they're also doing a ton of location shooting. Uh, a lot of new photos have popped up on the Reddit's leak page from the Mandal- um, from Andor as of late, showing that <clears throat> they're out on location. There's going to be a lot of, of live location shoots for that show. But I I anticipate that all uh, the majority of the live action shows are all going to very are all going to feel very cohesive. Um, I'm genuinely curious, though, as I've said so often, the most the thing that I look forward to the most are the theatrical releases. And what are those theatrical releases going to look like? All right. I have a lot more to talk about with this specifically pointed to Patty Jenkins further comments about Rogue Squadron and talking with the story group, which I found really, really interesting. You got to read between the lines of these comments that the director of Rogue Squadron makes to Collider. But there's some there's some key points that I want to bring up with regard to her working with the story group. So we'll dive into that again in my rant portion of the, uh, of the show a little bit later on. For now, though, let's go ahead and get into... Uh, just a couple of different news items and uh, and leaks this week. We are the sp- 
park. It'll light the fire. It'll burn the first order down. All right, first one here comes from Reddit. Somebody found this listing for a screen comics graphic novel focusing on Boba Fett. Now, this got leaked. And I saw the listings myself. These listings were supposed to be industry only, not available to the public. Um, So in the link for the Screen Comics graphic novel, novel, that was, again, supposed to be for the industry, where industry types are going to be privy to this information before the general public is. Um, The exact blurb about the release date was found in the key selling points drop down a window on this site that got leaked and it showed that the book of boba fett premieres on disney plus december of 2021 we already know this right um and season three allegedly of the mandalorian premieres on disney plus in spring of 2022 features photos and dialogue from the hit series the graphic novels it also says are uh going to be a major growth category right so this screen comics graphic novel again will feature photos and dialogue from the hit series and in this leak to the industry right it says that the graphic novels are going to be um a major growth category apparently there's been a resurgence in graphic novels and disney and lucasfilm plan on taking advantage of that so the big takeaway here though is this uh potential that we could get the mandalorian season three as early as spring of next year now there's been a lot of conflicting reports as of late as to what has filmed and what hasn't filmed for the mandalorian there was an interview between pedro pascal and ewan mcgregor and pedro of course plays mandalorian ewan mcgregor plays obi-wan kenobi and pedro had said that they hadn't begun filming yet however there were several industry sources who said the mandalorian season three had begun filming already and there's also been quite a bit of talk that the book of boba fett will feature the Mandalorian in that show as well. And I talked about this on a previous episode. I think the Mandal I think the Book of Boba Fett might be um a combination of what we were supposed to get in the film that was canceled early on um after it was announced. This was prior to the 2015 Star Wars celebration in Anaheim where they were supposed to be bringing out the director of the Bo- of the of the Boba Fett film and it turned out that it was canceled after the director um got busted for I believe some some drug use or some controversy surrounding him. So I think the book of Boba Fett is going to be a bit of a combination of what was supposed to be in that film and also this story that got leaked a couple of years back when we heard about the live action Disney shows that there was potentially a show focused on the cantina on Tatooine, where you'd have these characters drift in and out of the cantina going on adventures. Now, that could have been referencing what ended up happening in The Mandalorian, but um, there is a lot of sort of commentary swirling and rumor swirling around the Book of Boba Fett's kind of going to be this catch-all show to continue to perpetuate this part of the timeline post-Return of the Jedi while continuing to expand on The Mandalorian, giving that show a little bit of breathing room as they shoot a new season, and probably push the timeline forward a bit, and I think that's going to be important for Disney and Lucasfilm, because Grogu is going to have to make an appearance at some point in time later on in The Mandalorian. I can't imagine they're going to give up on that storyline, which how popular that character has become. But in order to have that happen, he's going to have to be with Luke, at least in my opinion, for a little bit of time. So I think the I think the Book of Boba Fett's going to serve as a nice sort of storyteller buffer for those uh, who are old enough and used to watch uh, the show 24, where every episode takes place in 24 hours. You know that there are always these sidebar plot elements, like the daughter getting caught in the woods being chased by a jaguar, that simply existed to help get the clock further down the line while Jack Bauer, the protagonist, traveled from one location to another. I grabbed uh, several comments, and I wanted to share uh, these with you based off commentary around this leak on the Reddit leaks page. Jack Hoof Scavenger said this, If it's true the Mando, the, the, the Mando Season 3 is coming in, in, in the spring, the schedule could be something like this. December through January, we get the Book of Boba Fett. February to April, we get Andor Season 1. May to June, we get The Mandalorian Season 3. July to August, we get Kenobi. And then maybe September to December, we get The Bad Batch Season 2. Now, I find all that really interesting and completely and totally plausible. What I'm wondering, though, is 
how true that will end up being because I can't help but wonder if Disney is going to try to keep the releases in somewhat chronological order. I, I don't think it's possible to do that at this point in time. You know, you got the Bad Batch taking place. If you look at the order on a chronological timeline, you have the Bad Batch taking place first. Um, then you've got Kenobi and Andor in there somewhere, right? Which then you jump past the original trilogy, because we're pre-original trilogy, pre-A New Hope at that point in time. And then we jump past that to the Book of Boba Fett, and then we get The Mandalorian. I don't, I see, and I just think it would be really odd to have the Book of Boba Fett released, which is post-Return of the Jedi, followed by the Andor show, which is pre-all of that and A New Hope. Then to jump back over to the Mandalorian post Return of the Jedi, only to jump back to Kenobi, it makes way more sense to me for Disney to release the Book of Boba Fett and the Mandalorian back to back. Then maybe Bad Batch season two, Andor and Kenobi, depending on where the timeline is. And again, this I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because I want to talk further about this later on in the show about what Disney is doing and whether or not they care about jumping around in the timeline when it comes to these shows or whether or not they believe the audience is simply smart enough to follow along, right? All right, let's get into some other comments here with regard to The Mandalorian Season 3 potentially coming out in spring of next year. CX52J said this. I've been saying this for a while. We're entering a new golden age of Star Wars now that Disney have worked out what they're doing, and don't have the existing expectation the sequels had. YMCA Destroyer said, I was thinking today that now that the Skywalker saga is all done, the creative team has to do the legwork to set up the next generation, which they've already started doing with Grogu, and presumably shows like Ahsoka will take further steps for that. The future beyond the original trilogy and sequel trilogy is essentially a blank canvas. And there's also the huge history before the prequel trilogy that can be told, not to mention the potential of the stories to be told during the reign of the Empire. There's a lot that can be done. I'm excited. I'm excited, too, and I agree with the majority of what that comment uh, that commentator had to say. Again, I just kind of scratch my head going, I, I really wish that, I pers- just from a personal curiosity standpoint, I wish I could see the overall game plan of Disney and Lucasfilm when it comes to the releasing of all this different content taking place in all these different eras. That's the one thing that I've that I've kind of loved about the MCU. I know a lot of people, obviously, right, it's been one of the biggest points of controversy on whether or not the sequel trilogy was or wasn't planned in terms of the storytelling. For me, John Justice, host of this show, I'm way more interested in um, the planning when it comes to the release of all these features and whether or not there's any focus on that at all. Let me get to one more uh, comment here about this Mandalorian Season 3 leak, and then I'll expand a little bit further on that thought. Spooky Terrence <laughs> writes this, I don't know how anyone can be upset with Disney at this point. Lifelong Star Wars fan dating back to watching The Phantom Menace in theaters Comments like that make me laugh just because I'm a lifelong Star Wars fan dating back to when the first movie came out in theaters, right? I just kind of go, I'm old because I'm 49 as of this week. Um, The (laughs) Spooky Terrence goes on to say, um, this is the greatest time to be a Star Wars fan ever. Content after content by competent writers um, pumping out excellence. I'll trade some excellent, uh, some, some bad sequels. Apparently I didn't like the sequels. Um, for that, no problem. Okay, and again, I love the I I I, I love the sequels. I, I love this the the, the the sequel films. Um, so again, getting back to before we dive into uh, some bad batch stuff, and then we talk Patty Jenkins, and uh, I go on a on a on a bit of a rant more so than I've already done. Uh, I'm very curious to see where Disney's head is at, and I wish I knew where Disney's head was at when it comes to releasing of all of this content. Um. Kevin Feige and what he's done with the Marvel Cinematic Universe is nothing short of amazing. Um, And yet, 
they've figured out a way with keeping um they figured out a way to keep chronological storytelling while still jumping around in the time frame and maybe that's what it comes down to maybe the audience is smart enough to to realize this and those that get confused and disney just relies on people <laughs> that that know those individuals to go and help them out to explain where certain things fall in the timeline but look at the black widow movie um going into black widow which was released this past week which i enjoyed um, it was on par with a lot of the spinoffs um, when it comes to the MCU, your uh, your Ant-Man. Um, I liked Thor Dark World, and I liked Black Widow just as much. Um, Thor Ragnarok is probably my favorite of the spinoff films, if not one of my favorite overall of all the Marvel MCU movies. Uh, but with, when, with Black Widow, that movie takes place after the events of Civil War. And I know my family heading in, heading in to go watch it. They all asked me separately because they weren't around when the first person asked, "When does this take place in the timeline?" And it was just a matter of saying this takes place after Civil War. And my family, you know, my wife and my kids were like, "Oh, okay, that makes sense," and we moved on. So perhaps that's Disney's mentality when it comes to pumping out the content that they create for Star Wars. They just assume people will go in and figure it out. Um, that being said, though, I still think that the MCU has done a really, really good job of jumping around in the timeline, but making it really, really easy to understand and making sure that embedded within the storytelling are key elements to immediately tell you where this is happening within the storyline. As always, uh, what do you think? Talkshownerd at gmail.com. Talkshownerd at gmail.com or leave a comment up on YouTube as well. All right, let's move over to um, The Bad Batch. The Bad Batch this week was really interesting. This was a story, and I'm going to get into spoilers here, where the Bad Batch kind of took a backseat in their own show. And in a word, it was very intentional what this episode was trying to do. It was Harris and Dula, a Star Wars story. Now, for those that aren't familiar, uh, Hera is um, originally from the uh, animated series Rebels, one of my favorite characters that has uh, that's that's come out in the Disney era of Star Wars storytelling. And uh, this episode of The Bad Batch was essentially her her beginnings. It was Hera's backstory, which is fascinating considering that, again, spoiler alert, um, Hera and uh, Caleb Dune, okay, who... Uh, also goes by the name of Kanan in Rebels. They are a thing, okay, in in Rebels. And we've now received, at the beginning of the Bad Batch, a bit of Caleb Dune pre-Kanan as a young kid, his backstory, during uh, Order 66. And now we got almost an entire... Well, actually, no, we did. We got an entire episode of the Bad Batch devo devoted on the beginnings of Hera's backstory. And I think we got that for a very specific reason. And again, this gets back into the storytelling element, what Disney is trying to set up by including these characters from multiple pieces of content leading towards the future. So in this episode of The Bad Batch, we, we are introduced to Hera. Um, we get background and backstory on why she wanted to be a pilot in the first place. We get to meet her mom, which was rad. Um, characters from the Clone Wars that were crucial to that series. Um, she is apparently 10 years old in this episode, which is really interesting because Omega is also 10 years old. And they are introduced together, which leads me to believe that perhaps Hera at some point in time may join up with the Bad Batch. And does Caleb Dune's character come back into play? And we get a first introduction of those two individuals. But this Bad Batch episode, I think, was essential for a for, for a reason. If we let the speculation run wild and consider what Marvel has done, then this episode and Hera's future on the Bad Batch could go a long way to establishing Hera among the casual fans who maybe haven't watched Rebels. And why? Well, because this could be setting the stage for her live-action debut in, say, Rangers of the New Republic or the Ahsoka show. These are important characters to the fandom. And 
less the casual fan, more of the little bit more than casual and hardcore fans that have watched the majority of this content. Because let's be honest, I think a lot of casual fans probably haven't sat down and watched um, Rebels or realized that the ghost of the signature ship and Harris ship from Rebels is featured prominently not only in Rogue One, but also in <laughs> The Rise of Skywalker as well. Hera is around for all these events, and so I can't help but speculate that this was clearly for a reason. You don't take an episode called The Bad Batch and essentially have The Bad Batch cameoed in their own show unless you're doing it for a reason, right? So I can't wait to find out what happens with Hera moving forward. And what this means for the character and her inclusion in other pieces of Star Wars content. More specifically, live action. We know that we are supposed to be getting this culmination of Rangers of the New Republic, the Ahsoka show, uh, the Mandalorian, and Boba Fett. Uh, Kathleen Kennedy, when they did the big announcement of all the upcoming Disney shows, commented that all these shows would culminate in one big event. We don't know if that's going to be a Disney live action streaming event or a theatrical release. I have to believe that this inclusion of Hera in the Bad Batch is a first step towards including her uh, in live action in some way, shape, form. And as I've reported on the show prior in other episodes, there has been a lot of rumors going around that perhaps Hera would end up stepping in and taking the place of the character that Gina Carano played. And she, of course, is no longer with uh, Disney and Lucasfilm. But. As always, what do you think? Talkshownerd at gmail.com. Let's move on to our uh, next news item this week. This is not going to go the way you think. Patty Jenkins talks collaborating with Lucasfilm on her Star Wars movie, saying it's a whole other way of working. So, speaking with Collider, director Patty Jenkins making strides in pre-production for her Star Wars debut as she zooms toward the December 2023 release date for Star Wars Rogue Squadron. Now, she talked with The Hollywood Reporter, as reported in Collider, that she was finishing up and already putting together a crew. Jenkins also teased a whole other way of working as she spoke about her collaboration with the Star Wars Brain Trust and said that they're pretty deep into the process right now. In June of 2021, uh, Lucasfilm did tap writer Matthew Robinson as her co-collaborator on the project. Jenkins told The Hollywood Reporter this, doing that thing with my fingers. It's going amazing. Uh, I had been on it already for six months before I even announced that. So we're pretty deep into it. We're finishing a script, accruing up. It's all going wonderful. I'm so excited about the story and excited that we're... Um, that we're the next chapter of Star Wars, which is essentially a responsibility and such an opportunity to really start some new things. It's really exciting in that way. Okay, New things is interesting to me. We're going to highlight that before we move on. Jenkins, who also revealed in the Rogue Squadron announcement video that she has a personal connection to the story, her father was an Air Force pilot, also added that she is fairly free to make a film that she wants to to do it is entire it's an entirely different way of working i'm on the phone with all of them i'm doing zoom meetings with everybody involved in star wars all the time i'm fairly free to do the story that we want to do but you really need to know who's done what who's doing what where it goes and how it works and what designs have been done before it's a whole other way of working that i'm getting up to speed on so a number of different uh, thoughts and questions popped into my head after hearing those comments from the Rogue Squadron director, Patty Jenkins. I'm curious how the story started. So, by example, John Knoll, who's been the driving force behind the special effects of uh, Lucasfilm, uh, going back to the beginning of the prequels, right, from ILM. He was the one who initially had the idea for Rogue One. Taking that snippet out of the opening crawl of A New Hope, he put together a, a quick synopsis, right, treatment of what a Rogue One story could be, handed it off to Kathleen Kennedy, and she loved the idea, and then we ended up, after a few years, getting Rogue One. So the question that I have is, okay, 
What was the impetus for the start of the story for Rogue Squadron? I don't think this was something that Patty Jenkins came up with herself. I think this is something that came from Lucasfilm was handed to Patty Jen- was handed to Patty Jenkins, who ended up leaning into it and wanting to do it because of her own desire to make a fighter pilot movie because of um, the connection uh, with her father. So I don't think this was a Patty Jenkins um, idea to start with, which raises the question for me of, okay, if it wasn't, then did whoever did whoever was responsible for the for the inception, right? For the idea, were they thinking about the future? of Star Wars and the theatrical releases, and most specifically, and I've been beating around the bush here, does this establish a new central plot that will carry forward in ongoing saga films, or is this just going to be another spinoff? Assuming that this is taking place after The Rise of Skywalker. So, let me get into my rant. And I'll be repeating a few things, but I want to kind of make this somewhat coherent. I'm still finding it curious that Rogue One is going to be the first theatrical release after the Rise of Skywalker and the end of the Skywalker saga. Now, this is more about me and my um, my own expectation of Star Wars, right? Um, I'm, I'll tackle this by looking at what Disney has done with other franchises and try to remove my expectations based off the past, right? But Past expectations based off of previous theatrical releases. It seems as if we're moving away from the trilogy arc. We had a protagonist that goes on a hero's journey or um, just a journey in the case of the prequel trilogy, right? The Disney era spinoff films all fed into that central storyline and those trilogies that came before them, right? Han's backstory, the comments of his joining Jabba the Hutt, and that connection at the end of the movie. Rogue One obviously had the direct ties into A New Hope. So the spinoff films that we got in the Disney era link up with the existing saga films. So you could actually, if you wanted to, right, which I've done, you know, you can actually watch all the films in chronological order and you'll get these little side backstories. Very similar to what the MCU has done, right, with the, with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, although they did it in a more linear fashion than what Disney has done. This Patty Jenkins Rogue One, uh, Rogue Squadron movie doesn't appear up front to be the start of a saga or trilogy. Um, going off that assumption, right, I'm wondering if... Rogue Squadron maybe has more of a kinship with, say, like Iron Man. When we look at what Disney has planned with the future theatrical releases. Um, None of us casual fans knew what we were in for when it came to Iron Man, right? When you think about superheroes, and I was a casual Marvel fan. I wasn't a reader of the comic books by any stretch. You know, I knew who Iron Man was, but I had no idea what his backstory was. And so here we get this amazing first film in Iron Man that kicks off 10 years worth of MCU movies that culminate in these fantastic uh, mega tentpole Avenger films, right? And they, they made a whole model from that. It appeared as if Disney was trying to head in that direction under Iger with Solo and possibly a Boba Fett movie, wherein... Instead of creating a new timeline of new films, they were going to include, all right, we already have this established saga here of these six movies. We're making number seven. Let's go ahead and make spinoff films that we can plug into the existing timeline and retroactively create and copy what the Marvel Cinematic Universe did in a linear fashion, we'll do it by going back in time and plugging in new films, which will essentially make the saga films the tentpole of this Star Wars cinematic universe, if you will. Of course, that ended up changing drastically after Solo's poor box office, and then, of course, COVID. We know that in live action, 
um, as stated before, looking at the 2022 slate and Kathleen Kennedy's comments about Ahsoka, Mandalor- um, the Mandalorian, Book of Boba Fett, Rangers of the New Republic. It's all supposed to culminate in one big event feature. Will the theatrical releases end up taking the same route? And this is what I'm driving at. I am fascinated by what Disney and Lucasfilm have planned for the theatrical releases in Star Wars. And going back to my initial comment in this rant, that's why I'm so intrigued by the fact that Disney is kicking off its next Star Wars theatrical release with what appears to be a spinoff or like separate Star Wars film called Rogue Squadron. We know that Taika Waititi has a Star Wars film that he is working on. Don't know what timeline time frame it takes in. It takes place. We know that Kevin Feige has a feature film that has individuals that are working on it, um, and he is uh, the the producer of it. Don't know when it's supposed to come out. We know that Ryan Johnson's trilogy. The last thing we heard was that it was supposed to still happen. Um, we know that we're getting Patty Jenkins' December twenty third, twenty twenty three Star Wars movie. Okay. And according to the official Star Wars website, the movie will introduce a new generation of Starfighter pilots as they earn their wings and risk their lives in a boundary-pushing high-speed thrill ride, the movie, uh, and move the saga into the future era of the galaxy. I'll double back to that in a moment. We also have untitled Star Wars films set to be released according to Disney's official timeline in 2025 and 2027. According to, an art, according to uh, some comments in an article that I pulled about that topic, they write, Initially, games of, uh, Game of Thrones creators David Benioff and D.B. Wise plan to write and produce those films, set to release in 22, 24, and 26. However, they ultimately exited the project to focus on their Netflix deal. So now, in addition to Rogue Squadron, we have two additional Star Wars films that are expected in 2025 and 2027. The plot for those films are still a mystery, and we'll be patiently waiting for more details. All right, so let's go ahead and go down a little bit further here. We had the Game of Thrones guys that were apparently supposed to write and produce those three films in 22, 24, and 26. Did that storyline get completely shelved and and moved off to someplace else? Because that sounds like a trilogy, right? Is that what Taika Waititi is working on? Or... Is Rogue Squadron, now set to release in 2023, the first of those planned films that Benioff and Wise were supposed to be in charge of that will now be coming out in 23, 25, and 27? My guess is that whatever the treatment was for the Benioff and Wise films in 22, 24, and 26 has been set off to the side. And Disney still plans on releasing films in 2025 and 27. But the question again is, are those films going to be attached to Rogue Squadron at all? So is Rogue Squadron the Iron Man Man of the new Star Wars theatrical releases? Or is it really just a one-off story? Or are we world building, introducing new characters that will be part of a larger saga with event films with multiple characters? When Disney gave us the the theatrical release schedule... You know, we had other movies listed, but with years apart from their releases. So obviously, Disney has no intention of following what the what the MCU did with their theatrical releases. And again, that goes back to what happened with Solo. I think that was the idea, is that Bob Iger and Disney thought that they could release multiple Star Wars films in a year and get away with it. And then they freaked out after Solo didn't perform well at the box office, and they completely tossed that idea out the window. Um, again, based on the release dates, it's a far cry from the from the MCU execution. And I don't see Disney spiking in spinoff films around tentpole blockbusters, which brings me back around to Rogue Squadron, right? Is this setting up for something bigger? Going all the way back to the start of the podcast and the show this week and the Collider article, you know, will this be something that's bigger? And I go back to that comment that, that that she made talking about moving the story forward, right? It appeared that um, we know that I got to get back to my notes here. I'm sorry. Um, I think that there is a still a huge possibility and inevitability that we get a George Lucas style trilogy again someday. It could be Ryan's 
They've said as much about what Ryan's trilogy was supposed to be. It could be Taika Waititi's film could be kicking off something. It could be that Rogue Squadron kicks off a new era of saga films that is followed by a Taika Waititi movie built off of what Rogue, Rogue Squadron was and a Kevin Feige film that was based off of Taika Waititi's and Patty Jenkins' film. Okay? Um, for me as a fan, I think that they're going to be letting the past die for now. Um, we got a Disney saga trilogy. It was met with mixed reviews, but ultimately successful. I think the Disney and Lucasfilm are probably going to take a step back from that trilogy aspect of it. So that when they do introduce whatever that trilogy is going to be or saga films is going to be, that it will be something that's met with a level of hype because we will have waited a really, really long time until we got that again. And I said this before, and I'll keep saying it. I I fully expect that eventually we'll get an episode 10. So, I'll end all my speculation if any of this made sense and my rant on this. Um, I also believe that Star Wars thrives on mythology and speculation. And with that will now always come with expectations and controversy. There's no escaping it, right? Um, when does this new overarching tale begin, and does it start with Rogue One? That's the big question that I have. Is Rogue One going to be a film like Rogue Squadron? Let's say it's good. Um, I'm excited for it. I love space battles. I love the idea of a... Starfighter pilot-centric movie a la Top Gun Star Wars. I'm completely down with that. That seems right That's right up my alley of the things that I enjoy. But when it comes to Star Wars, especially after watching the sequel trilogy this week, man, the mythology is so rich and deep. You know, As I mentioned on last week's show, is the protagonist or protagonist, are they going to be connected to the Force at all? Will the villain, will the bad guy in the film be connected, be connected to, the, uh, to, to the Force at all? This is going to begin to tell a larger story. Nobody really knew what we were getting into when we saw A New Hope and what would become of it. It was essentially a very simple story about the hero's journey of good versus evil that turned into this thing that we all know and love and that I've done hundreds of podcasts about since then. There's a possibility the Rogue Squadron could be that. It could be the start of a saga film wrapped up in this singular story about a fighter pilot that ends up becoming the core protagonist moving forward. I don't think that's going to be the case, though. Because I think that Disney knows they still have characters that are loved by the fans that they're going to have to revisit. Uh, Ray, Finn, and Poe specifically. I, I, I can't imagine that those stories are done by any stretch of the imagination. Which, again, <laughs> brings me right back around to Rogue, Rogue Squadron that has me strat scratching my head going, such an oddball one after everything that the fandom has endured. And maybe we'll all feel differently after having watched hours upon hours of new live-action Star Wars on the small screen before we get to December of 2023. Maybe our attitudes and tones will have shifted. And perhaps once we actually get, I don't know, like some details on when Rogue Squadron actually takes place and what the storyline actually is, right? Then we'll begin to know, all right, this is what they have planned. Why Disney doesn't tell us as fans, I have no idea. It'd be so simple, right? I'm just going to keep, hopefully, Kathleen Kennedy, if you're listening, just give us a little bit. Just confirm when Rogue Squadron takes place. <laughs> just start there. That would be so, so helpful. All right, you know what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyways. What do you think? Did that rant make any sense whatsoever? Are you at, as all, are you at all as curious as I am, right? I, I, I mean, we're getting a ton of Star Wars content, and I would love to see the grand plan of releasing all of this and how Disney intends to do that without confusing the heck out of the general public. Talk show nerd at Gmail. Uh, dot com. I'd love to hear from you and read your comments back on next week's show. Also, leave a comment up on YouTube. I need someone to show me my place in all this. All right. Thank you to everybody who ha who wrote this week. I got several birthday wishes and happy 4th of July and people asking me, uh, you know, what do you think about the Bad Batch? So I just wanted to grab friend of the show, uh, Miranda's uh, listener feedback this week and share it with you. And she writes this. Happy 4th. 
Thank you, Miranda. With all this talk about the Acolyte and Rogue Squadron, I'm actually more interested in seeing Star Wars Visions that's coming out this September. Interesting. Well, I've never been an avid reader or viewer of anime, but I think it will be interesting and unique to have this style of storytelling in fiction become part of the Star Wars universe. Plus, the Japanese culture has already become a powerful asset in bringing inspiration to the world of Star Wars, thanks to the influence of samurai warriors. In fact, I was actually watching Seven Samurai the other night. It should be a beautiful addition to uh, launch uh, to, uh, to Star Wars to launch on the Disney Plus app. I'll be watching Star Wars Visions, and um, I commented about it last week that on the list of projects that Disney is pumping out. Um, Star Wars Visions is way down low on that list. And a lot of that just stems from what I continue to mention, and that is the importance of mythology and storytelling. Since these stories aren't canon, and these artists were able to tell whatever they wanted to tell, I have no doubt that it's going to be interesting, right? And, and I'm curious in it because it's Star Wars. But it doesn't really lead to expanding the fandom or getting the fandom commentary generator up and running. I'll use the Rogue One example again. Rogue One is a movie that was widely received well by the majority of the fandom. Many people now say that it's their favorite of the Star Wars Disney era films, and yet there's no, there's nothing really to talk about with that movie. Spoiler alert, everybody dies at the end. But beyond that, there wasn't really any expansion of the mythology to, to chew on or to speculate or move forward. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but man, I miss the days of speculating about upcoming Star Wars projects. And after The Force Awakens, well, you know, before The Force Awakens came out, what is this going to be about? And then after The Force Awakens came out, where are they going to go with this next? And then seeing the trailer for The Last Jedi and what in the world's going on. And of course, we all know what happened after that. But the speculation never ended. Even among the controversy and divisions within the fandom, we were all still curious to know how this whole thing was going to wrap up in The Rise of Skywalker. And while we have a little bit of that in the storytelling, or we had a little bit of that in the storytelling that we've seen in the live action, and again, we're going to get fed next year, there's no doubt about it, and I'm sure Book of Boba Fett will kick open those doors, we're still playing in a timeline where we know the inevitability of where the broader story is going. So a lot of the speculation that we have now, say, around the Bad Batch and Omega, at least from my perspective, is, all right, well, what's going to happen to Omega, and why don't we see her at all moving forward after this? Going back to Black Widow, I won't spoil anything, but it's a very similar circumstance with Black Widow. Black Widow goes and fills in gaps in that character's backstory introduces new characters, and then gives a plausible explanation of why we didn't see him again. But it's not like you can really sit back and pontificate over what happened in that film apart from the post credit scene where you go, oh, okay, that'll be interesting. But Disney's not really doing that with post credit scenes. So maybe we will at the end of The Bad Batch, and maybe Omega is leading to further stalling that'll move beyond what we've seen so far or be in addition to the storytelling. But this is where I firmly believe Star Wars grows and thrives. Not in individual artists creating their version of Star Wars, like in Star Wars Visions, for as highly entertaining as that can be. But continued storytelling and myth building that gets the fandom talking and speculating and anticipating what comes next. It's weird for me as a fan because I know that we're getting a ton of Star Wars content very, very soon, right? We won't be able to escape it heading into next year, going back to the timeline that I shared with you at the start of the show. But at the same time, I also feel like the commentary around it's kind of dead because there's not really much to talk about apart from speculating on where the Bad Batch is, is heading but without further details, we have no idea because we don't know what happens to the Bad Batch. We don't know what happens with Omega. We know the events that take place after this story that we're watching, but it's hard to really speculate because inevitably you know, well, okay, they're not around during the time of Rebels 
And we haven't seen or heard of them in any of the storytelling post-Return of the Jedi. Star Wars needs the fandom talking about it. And I look forward to the day when we've got trailers we're looking at and we've moved further down the timeline and the storytelling to where we can feed in and really get back on that speculating of what things mean and what the future of these characters is. And I really only think that's going to be truly possible when we get past the storytelling of The Rise of Skywalker, which is hopefully what Rogue Squadron will end up being. All right, thank you so much for checking out the show this week. I really look forward to hearing from you, talkshownerd at gmail.com. If this is your first time listening, I hope you enjoyed the show and enjoyed listening to it as much as I did uh, recording it. As always, uh, if you want to support my nerd world in the Star Wars podcast, the way you can do that is if you are a reader or know a science fiction reader, head on over to Amazon.com and search for Embark, John J-O-N Justice, and pick up my science fiction space opera series. Five books available right now. Uh, book one is an is a kind of a blend of genres of apocalyptic military science fiction space opera that leads to a broader space opera saga in the books that follow. Right again, five books available now in ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Uh, book six in the series will be available in about a month from now. So if you have not started on the Embark uh, space opera series, do so now by heading over to Amazon.com and search for John J-O-N Justice and Embark, or go to uh, MyNerdWorld.net. All right, I hope you had a fantastic 4th of July holiday. Thank you so much for checking out the show, and I'll talk to you again next week. Bye. The Force will be with you, always. My Nerd World. <laughs> <laughs>